Welcome to the Rare Slot. My name is Rance, and these are the bonus episodes of the Booster Pack podcast. Now, if you don't know the Booster Pack, that's the show where I unwrap the stories and crack the mysteries of collectible games each and every episode. But here on the Rare Slot, what we can do is have a little bit more of a casual conversation about a trading card game or collectible card game related topic, whether that's something going on in the space at the time, or if it's something I just want to talk about, or perhaps it's even something suggested by you guys, the listeners. Now, on today's episode, we are going to be taking a listener suggestion, and that's actually one I got a few months back, almost maybe even a year. And when I first got it, I was a little bit confused and I didn't really know how to talk about it. And honestly, I wasn't really too familiar with it. And what happened is I ended up doing some digging and I ended up finding a really fascinating YouTube video that explained to me the breadth and importance of this particular topic in the trading card game space. Now that video, it was called the history of HTCGs. And it basically explained this entire genre of games that I was completely unaware of. Now, if you're not familiar, HTCGs are an acronym that you can probably guess most of, trading card game at the end there, but it's that lowercase h, the beginning that makes them fascinating. H stands for homemade, yes homemade trading card games. And they're exactly what they sound like. They can be uh, literally made by people in their basements or bedrooms or on their kitchen table, often sometimes even cut out from A4 sheets of paper with hand-drawn rules text and hand-scribbled pictures for flavor. It is absolutely fascinating to see that there is a community built up around these kind of games that that has been widely embraced. Now, these games are get shared by their creators amongst the community on social media and especially on content creation platforms like YouTube, where they get advice and they get feedback from the fellow people who are also creating as well. And they can trade cards and sell games and stuff like that, even through print on demand services like the Game Crafter. It's absolutely fascinating. And there's games in this genre that I feel like probably get more enthusiastic responses than some of the lower tier titles that hit widely published store shelves, like in toy aisles, in mass market stores, or even in the dusty corners of LGS display cases. Games like Sketchbook Chronicles and Heroic TCG and Adventure Realms all have got their enthusiastic fans in the HTCG community and were big name games at some point or another that that people loved playing and sharing and talking about. Now, as I said, I learned about all this through a video called The History of HTCGs, and it's actually a series now. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk to the author of that video today. And not only are they an emergent historian for the HTCG genre, they're actually probably one of the most prolific and key people in the HTCG community. They are, in fact, the creator of what is probably the most popular HTCG of all time, Chaos Galaxy TCG. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our domestic designer of cardboard creations today. That is somebody who for the last seven years has been spearheading their own YouTube channel focused on their homemade trading card game, Chaos Galaxy TCG. Why? It's none other than Chaos Galaxy TCG's Zach. Zach, how you doing, bud? I'm good, man. Thanks for that intro. So before what we're going to do is before we jump into the actual stuff that we talk about in uh that you talk about in that video i do want to know and i ask everybody on the channel this uh this particular question what's your personal history with uh trading card games so uh, it started when i was about 10 years old and my mum bought me that first pack of Yu-Gi-Oh cards and just such a special feeling right yeah (laughs) just yeah as soon as i opened it it it's just obsessed straight away like trading in the playground every day and then um, it got to the point there where you just want more and more and they're so expensive that me and a few friends at the time were just like, let's start making our own. And then it became a hobby from there. Art's always been like a passion of mine. So yeah, just snowballed from there really. And since that like age 10, just been making cards in my bedroom and it's become now like the Chaos Galaxy. That's amazing. So we're going to get into Chaos Galaxy in a second, but it's absolutely fascinating to see these, um, not just your game, but a ton of different games come up like through this like sort of handmade, cr- handcrafted way of going about things and, and sharing them online and stuff like that. Um, what really fascinates me is it sort of reminds me of various different artistic movements, you know, whether it's um, underground comics of the 60s or garage music of the 90s or even fanzines of the late 20th century. These are things that people share and, you know, you have to know them to know them, but they're just creative outlets for people who love the genre so much. And that's what that is. So with that in mind, like, how do you personally define what a HTCG is? Like, what what makes it a homemade trading card game? Is it that obvious? I, I think it is, yeah, just the, the homemade aspect of it. It's, you know, you're not going through, like, factories in China and, like, these huge design teams. It's just you or a group of friends 
in your bedrooms, in your living rooms, making trading cards. And that's, yeah, that's just the definition of it. And I think everyone in the community, had, they have that sort of route, whether they start out young or, you know, like as an adult. Well, it's something that's fascinating. And it seems like I've noticed that there's a bunch of young creators in the space as well, some of which are hand drawing their own cards. But then there's others who have seemingly like amazing artistic talent who can create almost very professional looking things. Is the, is the breadth of the genre like that? Is it is it everything from literally hand drawn cards on, as I said, A4 pieces of paper to almost professional looking products? Yeah, it is. I th yeah, just the full range. It's... um. You know, yeah, the sort of like nine year old kids setting up YouTube channels, like shaky videos on their phone with like pencil crayons and then full on like graphic designers making these like really astonishing designs on cards. Um, and I think that's the beauty of it. Like everyone sort of supports each other. It doesn't really matter how good your art is or how good your sort of rules are for the game or how well you've thought it out. It's just the, uh, yeah, the whole community is like, it's just, we all just have that passion for trading cards, which is, all you really need to be a part of it. That's amazing. And I, I see that on, uh, you know, videos, people are so supportive of this community. You know, like you said, whether it's a nine-year-old making their own YouTube videos and stuff like that. Now, we did sort of mention it briefly there and we'll sort of circle back to it in a larger piece, but it seems like content creation for these games is something that's so valuable to bring them to the community. Is this, is something like a YouTube video absolutely like necessary? Does a HTCG have to have a YouTube video? Are there other ones out there that that are just, you know, posted on things like other, other uh, social media channels yeah there's a few coming through on instagram that i've seen recently but i think youtube is youtube's probably the best platform for it because it, it it's you know it's trying to explain the rules for your game through instagram like a 10 minute youtube video or like a playthrough is just i think the easiest way to go about it but um yeah it's, it's spreading out a bit especially since the community started probably about 10 years ago where youtube was just the way you put out content there's now, yeah, Instagram, like Discord, Twitch, whatever. There's quite a few ways it's branching out. And there's something very interesting in there as well, because these are, like I said, you know, I liken them to artistic movements where it's more about being able to create in this space that the people are so passionate about. It's not about creating cards that they think that they're going to be able to sell in booster packs for $6.99 or whatever it is, whatever it is. Is that, would you say that that is a key part of it, that there is no sort of business aspirations to a HTCG? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I've, I've spoken to people like board game designers and things, and it, it seems to be a thing. If you want to go about making money, don't make a trading card game. Almost. Like um, <laughs> just sort of the amount of work that needs to be put in, you know, like designing different cards and things. Whereas if you make a board game, it seems like there's so much less work like for the end product, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's about the passion of making the cards, not the marketability really. Absolutely. Well, to speak to that, you know, the whole one and done of board games is so much more alluring to people who are trying to look professionally. But nowadays, obviously, the space in trading card games is very hot. And a lot of uh, things like um, uh, new companies are coming into the space and, and sort of starting to explore it. So I'll be interested to just talk about that later in the episode. But I do you sort of mentioned it there when it, you sort of mentioned the brief history and YouTube being tied up with it. Can you give me a basically a brief history of, of HTCGs in the community that um, puts forward these games? Yeah, so having, having done a bit of research on it, the first video I think was in 2011. It was a guy called Peter Jank who just made made cards at home. I think he was about 30. Um, they were they were quite decent looking cards, and then just posted a couple of videos online. But it wasn't until a couple of years later that a few other games started popping up, and then they'd, they'd find each other's channels, comment, do like collabs, design cards for each other, and that was when the small community sort of formed. And there were probably about 10 or so games regularly uploading youtube videos there um and then that grew so i'd say about 2014 15 was when it really became a sort of community of sort of like hundreds of people um and now yeah it's still still going strong right right so you mentioned there obviously you know a couple of games came along and that inspired some other people to start creating and then there was this big cavalcade of of sort of um uh, new creators in the space and other people who will want to go on and so much support from each other, encouraging each other, seeing each other's designs, doing different things in that space. Um, so tell me about like, what, what was it that sort of, you know, you said in 2015 or whatnot, there was a big tide change in the, in the community and, and it was a boom. Was, do you, what do you attribute that boom to? I, I think it was people bouncing off each other. There were 
a few smaller channels who just got to round about a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And because of the homemade aspect, a lot of people who were watching them just thought, okay, this, this, you know, this guy's making a card game in his bedroom. I can do it as well. Um, and then, so there were a few of these earlier channels, I think just really inspired people to start making their own games. And then obviously there, there will have been so many people making their own card games in their bedrooms that didn't have anything to do with YouTube. And then these smaller channels popped up. They thought, Hey, I'm, I'm making my own game. I can make a YouTube channel for it too. And then, yeah, that, I think that was when it blew up really when people, some of the people saw those earlier channels and thought, Hey, I can do like, this just seems easy. Why can't I do this too? It's so rich for creativity because like every game isn't like, oh, you know, I want to put Marvel characters in a game. That's not what these are. These are original stories and original lore that people come up with and original rule sets. It's not just like, oh, this is my version of this game. You know, it's Pokemon, but it's, uh, you know, a different franchise or something like that. No, these games are, are wholly original. And I think that's something that's really fascinating because we're seeing sort of new ideas come into the space at a ra much more rapid pace as technology picks up. Now to speak to that technology, obviously places like YouTube, it sort of, I've seen that it sort of outgrew YouTube a little bit. It sort of went to places like, um, I guess like places like Reddit have homemade TCG forums nowadays. And I'm no doubt, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, discords as well uh, are very, very active. How have you seen as somebody who's been in the space for at least since that 2015 boom, maybe even earlier, uh, how have you seen that sort of change the way that people uh, interact with HTCGs? Um, it, it's just, it's easier to get in touch with the creators, really. Before, all you had to do was, like, the only way you could get into contact with the HTCG creator was through a YouTube comment, whereas now you can actively chat to them. Um, and I think it's good for the games, really, because it's, you can get instant feedback if you if you sort of discuss your rules on Discord, you can get the opinion of four or five people who are passionate about TCGs and it just, yeah, definitely makes for a better game in the end. So um, I think it's been a really positive thing like Discord and Reddit since they've come in. Well, you call it any one of your videos and I'm really fascinated by it. It's like you can get that instant feedback because making a YouTube video, and I think, it, you know, perhaps you mentioned it in one of your videos, um, it's very, very hard to make a YouTube video that might have an error in it or something you've forgotten to mention and then have to go back and edit that because that video is always going to sit there and people are going to watch that and get confused about future versions of the game and stuff like that. So it's it's really fascinating to see these games come up, especially now that we're getting, uh, you know, people are getting a lot more... Um, uh, talented when it comes to you know picture design and stuff like that but there is something immensely charming about the the htcg uh games that are out there especially the hand-drawn ones yeah i mean well mine mine started as yeah just doodling in my bedroom age 10 with my pencil crayons and the, i still i still have a lot of those cars just in boxes in my bedroom and like go back going back and looking at them i'll find more inspiration i think from those images than like say a sort of professional trading card game that's out there well that's fascinating it sort of actually brings me to my next question I, i'm interested you know i mentioned it in the intro but you are one of the most you know sort of prolific creators in the space tell me about your experience coming up in the htcg world like what was your experience you said you you know you started doodling there at 10 in your bedroom like is that when you were starting posting things to youtube tell me all about that and and eventually how um how you became you know chaos galaxy tcg in the community yeah, so I, I always made the, the, the games growing up in my bedroom and played them with my younger brother or whatever. But then I just came across on YouTube. I was wondering if other people did the same thing. So just searched on YouTube, found the small community that was growing and then thought, hey, I like, you know, I've always been making games, which I'd improved since the age of 10. I was about 17 when I made the Chaos Galaxy um, and just went from there. And the, the Chaos Galaxy was really because I, I loved Yu-Gi-Oh playing it. I played it till I was like 18. And then I think around the time Pendulum Summoning came out, I was just like, this is too much for me. I can't handle this game anymore. Everybody has a Yu-Gi-Oh summon, which they drop off at. Like, I feel like every time they lose a wave of people, it's because they've got a new way to summon monsters. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's so true. But around that time, I just thought that, yeah, there's, there'd been problems occurring in the game for so long. I was like, I'm, I'm just going to put all my energy into Chaos Galaxy and sort of fix what I felt was broken in the only other TCG I knew at the time, which was Yu-Gi-Oh. So kind of made my own rule set, put some things on the internet, and then, yeah, the, the game kind of came from there. And joining the community, as soon as I put that first video up and I had, like, two subscribers or whatever, there were already members with, like, 
you know, like thousands of subscribers commenting on my videos, like, oh, this game's great. Like, can't wait to see where it goes. Just really supportive. And then carried on through, yeah, from there. And then um, got to where I am now, which is like sort of 20, 26,000 subscribers, I think. It is fascinating. And I love to hear what you just said there. You know, you said that, and this, I, I believe this is still part of the HTCG community. It was so encouraging to see the people, you know, who are ne basically now you nowadays, encouraging new people who are coming out on YouTube and who are sharing their videos for the very first time, you know, encouraging them to, to keep going. And maybe next time, you know, you comment or subscribe to somebody and they, their HTCG becomes one of the next chaos galaxies or whatnot. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing. It's just, there's, there's no one, there's nothing negative to say in the community, really. Like if, unless someone like rips off another person's game, it's like, no, you're, you're being creative. You're putting time and energy into this project. No one's really going to put you down for it. Well, I think it's so fascinating because when you compare it to like traditional trading card games, which are a very expensive hobby, as I'm sure you know firsthand, you know, nobody feels ripped off by these games. You know, everybody is so excited because there's no, uh, there's only emotional investment. There's no financial investment. So there, there can be that encouragement. Nobody feels cheated unless, you know, like you said, some, God forbid somebody takes somebody else's game. But at the same time, it's so fascinating to see that this encouragement has led to things like Chaos Galaxy. And I love the fact, and, and what I've loved about the community from learning from it is that positivity. Like you can go on to any any HTCG website, uh, or sorry, YouTube channel, and see the comments, even from more recent ones, and just see the positivity from the community. It's it's probably the only uh, the only subgenre I would suggest check the comments rather than don't check the comments. Yeah, yeah, so true. Yeah, and even like the like to dislike ratios on videos, you you it's rare to see more than like two dislikes on a HTCG video, and they'll just yeah there'll be dozens of. They like even hundreds of likes to one dislike ratios on videos. That's fantastic. Now, I was going to ask, um, why do you think um, you, like, is it that encouragement that kept you going? Because I believe, I, I mean, I think I clocked it at seven years you've been making Chaos Galaxy. Is that what has driven you to create it? And why do you think Chaos Galaxy has endured so much in the community and become one of the most uh, iconic games? Yeah, because it is a lot of hard work making a game, obviously, just making the game is the very start and then you have to keep releasing new cards that's the point of like a collectible card game there's always new stuff to collect um but i do it's like any creative project i have times there'll be months at a time when i'm just not feeling it and i won't create any new cards for the game and then there'll just be like a week where i'll make like an entire new set um and it it's hard but yeah the the, the comments and the positive energy of the community is the main thing that keeps me going really um and it's sort of, i've built this platform up until now that there's people supporting me i'd almost feel i'd be letting them down if i like stopped uploading for a few months or whatever that's amazing well obviously again you know because there isn't that financial need you know you don't unlike regular tcgs that you know essentially die when they stop making releases yours will forever live on because there's no release schedule that you need to keep up with or anything like that it's absolutely amazing to watch your game have grown you know you can go back and click on your videos from 2015 2016 and see where it is today so with that in mind, um, just give me an overview. How do you feel like you have changed as a designer and how has Chaos Galaxy changed over that seven years? Yeah, well, I've, 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 I've just improved a lot in terms of my ability to make artwork. Like I go back to some of the set one cards and I'm like, who the heck was like, interested in this? It's awful. Um, and now I'm on set five of the game and um, yeah, just really pleased with how it's coming together. But the sort of competitive side of the game has picked up now as well. So I'm making the abilities for cards a lot more interesting. And the gameplay is really where I think the biggest change has come in since the, that first release. And I was just testing cards out with my brother or whatever. And whereas now there's a whole sort of group of players and they give me feedback from if, if they have a tournament or something and they find this one card that's really broken, they're like, oh, you need to fix this. Or in the next set, maybe make more cards that focus on this aspects of the game rather than the, this current one to make things more exciting um which is it's a real sort of sweet spot of kind of creator to like consumer the feedback loop yeah you're so sort of tight with your fan base that um you can just sort of tweak anything and get it to how they want it because from back in my Yu-Gi-Oh days 
every set that got released, there were just complaints about every card that came out, like from somewhere or another. Well, again, it's it's interesting again to point out that this is a um a game or even you know a genre of HTCGs is driven by passion and not by price. You know, like so in Yu Gi Oh, obviously Konami's motivation was we need to sell booster packs, so the next you know the next special summon type needs to come out and be better than the last, or the next you know we don't need blue eyes dragon, we need a three headed blue eyes dragon or whatnot. Um, and it's really fascinating to see that sort of feedback loop come back in a, such a more such a more pure way, you know, like obviously, you know, you can get the feedback from your players directly and, and start to iterate on that and change the things that you can. And, and there's nobody really taking it seriously. There's no prize money on the line as far as I know. And there's no, um, you know, there's no, again, no financial investment, only emotional investment. So everybody is so enthusiastic about this game of yours. Yeah. Yeah, it is really sweet. It's amazing. So you said there, like, almost you sounded like you're not the one organizing tournaments. And that might be true. Tell me about, like, do the fans of this game just take it upon themselves to start hosting these organized plays for your own game? Yeah, that's how it started. Initially, I was just posting stuff on YouTube. And then someone else made a Reddit page and a Discord page. And people started talking to each other, theorizing combos and decks and stuff. And then they found an online platform called untap.in, uh, which is, just, is, yeah, like a tabletop simulator, really. And um, someone just emailed me like, hey, can I have digital copies of some of the cards? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then I wasn't even aware of this at the time, but there was like a sort of eight-man tournament going on. And then there was like a, a meta and like deck tier lists coming out um, of like what's the best deck or not. And then, yeah, like a year after that, I found out and sort of got involved with making tournaments and stuff, but it's all run by like the, the competitive side of the game is run by another guy who just does it for fun. The passionate fan who has taken it upon themselves to, to evolve your game into this uh, beyond your bedroom, into this, this thing that is treated as if it was, you know, akin to Yu-Gi-Oh, akin to magic, akin to Pokemon. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah, really a really big compliment, I guess, at the end of the day, but I've, I help out in like I help out any way I can to make the tournaments more fun and I'll put the word out on my YouTube channel. So they're they're like completely linked. But a lot of people are interested in the game from that perspective of, oh, I want to watch this guy because I'm a nine-year-old who makes card games in his bedroom. And some people are like, no, I want to play this game for the competitive side. I guess like any TCG really. Yeah, well, you've got, you know, you've got your different uh, player psychographics, as some companies call it, you know, where you've got people who just want to be into it for the cool characters and the cool pitches. And then you've got, you know, your, your spikish characters who want to go to break the game and, and prove that they can do the best work they can. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that, just on a sort of micro scale. Well, it's it's a completely amazing to see that you've bought this, you know, um, this sort of habit or this sort of, um, this sort of, a gameplay style from other trading card games into your own microchasm that obviously it repeats itself um, in these sort of spaces. Now, I guess my question there is like, how have you seen as somebody who's sort of chronicling the history of HTCGs, how have you seen things like untap, like tabletop simulator change the way are your, is your game the only one that gets played competitively or other games starting to get that sort of same following? No, there's definitely quite a few out there that have tournaments um and they're they're a lot more pushed by the actual creators of the game i think but it's it's yeah it's, it's definitely a recent thing like the past three years or so that's only started to come up um whereas yeah before then it was just a much more i make cards in my bedroom and it stays in in my bedroom <laughs> it's amazing to see like you know characters and stuff like that that you created that people you probably never would have expected people uh you know lauding these characters saying oh no i've got to use this to beat this deck and everything like that it's it's absolutely fascinating now you said that i guess sort of you were inspired by Yu Gi Oh and stuff like that um is that sort of is is the mechanics of the game itself very um baseline sort of Yu Gi Oh and you built on top of that uh no i wouldn't say so i think when it when it started out it was like i'll take the rules to Yu Gi Oh fix them and then go from there and when set one was released it was sort of similar to like the first Yu-Gi-Oh set where like legends of blue eyes where there were really simple monsters with no abilities and then there was the odd like resource card that had super simple abilities but since that first set and i've you sort of realized that the way the game is played 
the meta isn't the same as Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, for example, Monster Reborn or something, that card like wouldn't be very good in my game. So the, the sort of card abilities and stuff have drifted re like really far away from that. I and mean, the gameplay is now really different. That's really fascinating. Now, you obviously spoke about meta there and also rules as well. Like, do you, this is really interesting. Like, do you um, have like a rule book for your game or is it literally people just who are playing the tournaments, jumping back to your YouTube videos going, no, in video 77, he said that you can do this. <laughs> There's a bit of, but there is a rule book. So if you buy a, a base galaxy, which is a starter deck, uh, you get a rule book with it and there's a like there's online on the game's website there's rules but there is stuff in videos where I've I may have mentioned something that contradicts the rules accidentally and people do get in arguments uh due to my sort of lack of consistency within my own game but I'm only human at the end of the day and I think people take it quite lightly fascinating and again like I said with no money or huge prizes on the line obviously it's a little bit more and it's passion driven you know that's sort of what we discovered here it's passion driven so there's no like as you would expect out of a regular trading card game like sticklers for the rules and stuff like that it's a pretty fluid way to look at it and I love the energy and the vibe that 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 really encapsulates in chaos galaxy yeah thanks that's awesome now my question I guess as well is like how do you approach I've spoken to a lot of trading card game designers on this and I'd love to hear your um, your take on it like how do you approach designing a new set do you like you like you said you hear feedback and here you go all right i gotta make sure i've got some more defensive creatures in this one or i've got to make sure whatnot or is it just like oh you know what i would love to put something i'd like to put like a three-headed harpy dragon into my next set like what what's your approach to like doing the next set so yeah i take i, I take i think i take the approach from quite a few different places if i have to make a set of 100 cards quite a few of them will I'll, they'll be based on the artwork first of all if i've I don't know, say watched a film set in like, Aztec times or something, I'll go, oh, that's, you know, particularly inspired by that this week, I'll design a set of like an archetype or something that's sort of Aztec themed. And then abilities wise, yeah, it'll be people off the Discord or like the competitive scene um, will like, that. sometimes they even just suggest whole card abilities. And I'll be like, yeah, that, that fits the game. I'll put that on a card or... Um, one thing with the game, so the way the game works, that it's set in a galaxy of eight different planets and each planet has a sort of play style that goes with it. And you build a deck of creatures from different planets, but you will have this sort of overall strategy. And I think that really helps. Like I know some, some planets are sort of very aggressive. So that just gives you a basis for an ability. Some are more like combo based or whatever. That's fascinating. So each planet is sort of like, I mean, I guess to use the parlance, like a, a Magic the Gathering color pie type thing where you've split up different abilities for each planet. Yeah, pretty much. That's uh, that's really fascinating. Well, actually you mentioned in there, I think this would be a good time to do it. Um, Tell me, like, just give me like a, you know, the elevator pitch of how you play your game. Does it have life points? Like, do you have a hand of cards? Like, tell us, uh, you know, what uh, as trading card game players, we would see familiar in your game and what we would see different. Yeah, so you'd have a deck of 34 cards and then you have one planet card, which you keep separate and that gives you a constant ability throughout the game. And yeah, draw a deck, like draw five cards from your deck. Um, you use your creatures to attack your opponent's planet and gain points. And when you hit 20 points, you win. Wow, okay. So you're building up points instead of taking down points like in say a Yu-Gi-Oh or a Magic. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. That's amazing. And it sort of actually reminds me, obviously, you know, having a having a set, you know, planet card, you know, there's a lot of games like uh, Legend of the Five Rings or something like that that have like a stronghold um, where you sort of have like a starting location and that's sort of where everything builds from. It's absolutely fascinating to hear that that's, that's something that you arrived at as well. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, because because going into it when I first made the game age 17, I, I hadn't done as much research as I should really. I just sort of, uh, yeah, came up with a lot of the rules and was only really familiar with the rules of like Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon. Um, so I thought that just seemed like quite an original idea at the time, but yeah, obviously like now I know there's quite a few games that have that concept in them. Well, obviously it's a good idea because other successful games have used it and stuff like that. And it's obviously something you're seeing from, uh, players that play your game and stuff. And you said there was eight planets. Has there always been eight planets since the start or did you add some planets along the way? Like, how did that go? Yeah, that, that started as seven and then I made a sort of lore story for the game from like requests of fans. So I wrote this story and then the final chapter is like there's the creation of a new planet. Um, so that came out last year with set four. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's quite nice. It's just made a new angle for the game really. Um, so going into set five, there's a sort of whole new 
direction I can take a lot of the creature characters. That's fantastic. And you also mentioned in their lore, which is not something I thought about asking you about, but how do you disseminate this lore? Like, do you just make videos about like, this is what happened in this thing? Do you publish stories? Like, tell me all about that. Yeah, it was, it was sort of just written uh, by me and then I, I'll do sort of vid like, yeah, make YouTube videos that are about five minute long chapters and feature sort of characters in the game, in the lore. Um, and I think that's quite a big like drawing for people with people, you know, if you can watch, watch this sort of like sort of cinematic story that goes with a game, it like, kind of really brings you on board and it just lends itself quite well to YouTube too. Yeah. That's awesome that you've, you know, created this sort of content creation, you know, wheel of, of characters and, and gameplay and then new sets and stuff like that. It's absolutely fascinating to see. Do you ever, do you ever think that, do you think this is something that you're a hobby that you'll continue with? forever like do you think that there's an end inside or something that you do you want to one day put an end to the chaos galaxy sort of story and just be like that's that or do you just see this going on forever uh, i can see the game maybe ending but I, I couldn't see myself stop making trading cards i think i'd have to start a new game up afterwards but yeah i don't i didn't really go into it with a name i just made the i'd always been making cards as a hobby set up the youtube channel and thought let's just see where it goes and i never planned for a a law or like a competitive scene to come from that like initial idea of the game um but yeah we'll just see where it goes i think there's something that i want to pull out there you know you said you never planned for a competitive scene so i assume maybe you were slapping you know numbers and effects on characters without too much thought did you do you personally have like a play testing process like a normal like like a, a fully published trading card game would or something like that or do you just like rely on the community to give you that feedback and you alter as needed it's mainly the community like when I first started, you, you're right there. Yeah, there were, it was just me slapping numbers on a card being like, okay, this is more powerful than this one, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now it is, I'll, I'll, I'll make YouTube videos showing cards before their release. And then people will give feedback in the comments section or like they'll, I'll, I'll send some sort of sample cards to the competitive guys and they'll test things out. Be like, nah, this is way too powerful. You've got to change it for the release. Um, and it's, yeah get that sort of that sort of like beta testing really of all cards that would come out that is absolutely fascinating to see that much like you know any other trading card game it's sort of evolved this own sense of like a micro play test group you know like you said you've got beta play testers and everything like that that is absolutely fascinating to hear um so with all of that said, like that sounds like Chaos Galaxy is really interesting. And obviously there'll be links to the in the description of whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to the audio version or whatnot of Chaos Galaxy down in, uh, down in the descriptions of this episode. Uh, so you can find it and sort of discover it yourself. But I mean, let's jump back to the actual community at large, the HTCG thing. Now, I'm a, obviously a massive trading card game or collectible card game guy. And I saw a huge influx, you know, relative to the community when it came to everybody shutting down in COVID and everything sort of, you know, sort of coming to a halt. Did you guys see that in the HTCG community or even specifically for Chaos Galaxy's competitive scene? Is that something that you guys had as well? Yeah, hundred percent. In the, the homemade card game community, so many people, you know, you were just sat at home with nothing to do. Loads of people were just browsing YouTube or drawing. And then kind of the combination of those two things is like, yeah, making a YouTube channel based on your drawings, which a lot of homemade TCG like games were born from that, I think. Um, yeah, COVID definitely, as soon as lockdown started, like I saw sort of jumps in views on my channel. A lot of new games were being created that are still going now. Yeah, yeah, it definitely helps. Yeah. Well, it's so fascinating because the other thing that I saw obvious that come come out of COVID shutdowns and stuff like that, there was a lot of interest in the trading card, the more traditional trading card game space or whatnot. But a lot of independent creators, people who might have previously been, you know, HTCG creators, whether they shared them on the traditional, you know, Reddits or whatnot, um, came about. You know, one of my previous interviews was with people who have come about through this sort of Kickstarter era or Renaissance era for published trading card games. So does in the HTCG community, is it is it have you noticed the conversation shift between you know, this is just something we're doing for fun. We have no expectation about this game. You know, this is something we want to share to being more, uh, maybe I could be another one of these, these, you know, commercially viable trading card games, these Kickstarter trading card games. Have you seen a change over that time recently? Um, yeah, there's been a few more channels pop up who are 
to have joined the community but but have projects on Kickstarter too. Um, the sort of the line I think is becoming a bit more blurred, but it is then of course like when you have this professional game that you're trying to fund and make commercial, it's no longer homemade. Uh, so it's tough, and there is a, there is quite a lot of debate between that, and some people in the community don't really, you know, like the fact that some people are trying to sort of take it beyond the hobby. I don't really mind personally, but. Yeah, it's so fascinating to see this shape and this change. You know, as we said, you know, COVID changed so many things and and making trading card games outside of, you know, what they call the big three was something that really COVID brought in for us. So it'd be so fascinating to see how the um, trading card game or, you know, homemade trading card game community changes around this. And if this becomes, you know, like an indie band scene or something like that, where it's like you can come up through the indie band scene, you know, like you were the strokes or something like that, and then release on Kickstarter and be a mainstream success. Like where this art form is sort of shifting from, you know, these were just people who were basically a garage band coming into, you know, releasing full sets, releasing full products and stuff like that. It's really fascinating if you take you know, the business side of it and look at it as an art form. It's it's really interesting. You know, maybe in 10 years time, they'll be accusing games of selling out to Kickstarter and stuff. Yeah, yeah, completely. <laughs> I can see that happening. It's a, it's an absolute fascinating thing. So do you, as you know, like I said, as somebody in the, uh, you know, you said you don't really mind or anything like that, but if something is funded on Kickstarter or gets into um, local game stores, do you still consider it a uh, uh htcg at that point or does that lose that label altogether like do you have you seen success from the community come to those places um do you know it, it hasn't really happened i don't think yet there's there have been games who've come from kickstarter onto youtube but never i haven't seen a game go from the homemade community then gone on to kickstarter and become successful and they've like gone beyond the community and they're no longer they've sort of you know, gone above it, like those sort of indie bands no longer playing in like your local venue. It's an interesting parallel. Now, I mean, I guess that sort of begs the question, would you ever consider doing something like a Kickstarter or a game fund for uh, Chaos Galaxy? I have thought about it. I think with Chaos Galaxy, I probably wouldn't because I like make having made the game for like seven years, having got, grown as like a artist and a designer gone through this whole process i think if i were to do that i'd finish chaos galaxy and start an entirely new game because i know i could make a better one now um whereas when i started the channel and the game as soon as you make that video explaining the rules it's like right that's locked in this is what the game is now um and yeah there's definitely some problems have arisen along the way <laughs> well would that consideration extend to, and again, I now I'm just being a fanboy, uh, be, making hypothetical uh, questions here, but would you consider, like if somebody came to you and said, hey, t we, we see what Chaos Galaxy is. We, we love th what this is. If we put money behind it, if we put something behind it, you know, for you to become a creator in this space, you know, to do a Kickstarter for Chaos Galaxy, you know, 2.0 or whatever you, it would be decided to be called. Is that something you'd be interested in? I think so, yeah. If the opportunity came about, I would... Yeah, I'd like to see where it can go. I mean, you said it hasn't happened yet, but I think it would be fascinating to see. It might even come about, you know, with so much interest in trading card games and so much interest on Kickstarter, perhaps, you know, somebody gets picked up, you know, maybe there's companies that are going to be like, well, we make, we can make art, we can print cards. Maybe we'll go to, you know, much like the music scouts going to, you know, the the indie locations uh, to find new bands. This might be a way that, that, trading card game publishing companies want to try and find new talent and raw talent it's really fascinating yeah definitely i think kickstarter would be the best way to go about that i think um just through posting things on like youtube and reddit and stuff there's only so far you can go well, they say about Kickstarter, the bit, most important thing is having an established community before you get started. And obviously, as we've talked about, that's something that you have in spades there. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. That leads me to the question. Okay, so there's a few other questions because obviously, I mean, again, I have to look at HTCG through the lens that unfortunately I've been conditioned to look at them through, uh, through regular trading card games. So it makes me ask the question, you know, obviously, the, you, you know, you said people can buy stuff on uh, game, uh, what are we sort of game crafter for your game like right now right is that correct yeah so that's just a website that sort of prints by demand um, so I'd have someone in the US say like yeah I want to buy some I want to get my hands on some packs of Chaos Galaxy cards and um, the website yeah it just literally says if they want to buy four packs they just print four packs 
send them to the customer and it keeps on that small basis like i've spoken to sort of manufacturers and if you know you go to the far east and they they like it's like no you must order like a minimum of five thousand packs before you can get your game off the ground and it's like yeah okay I'm not ready for that yet I'm so interested to hear that you've explored that. That's so fascinating. Now, what I do want to ask about that, because it does circumvent, you know, like a traditional trading card games that do do uh, overseas publishing or overseas printing and stuff like that, and then import their things. Now, a big conversation in the trading card game space at the moment is limited edition things, scarcity, all that sort of stuff. How does things that we expect from a trading card game, you know, the more money driven ones that we mentioned earlier, like uh, how does rarity and scarcity and, and even secondary market things affect HTCGs. Like, is that something that exists in the world of uh, homemade trading card games? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, you know, I think it's it's one of the biggest drawings to trading card games, if not the biggest one, just finding that rare card. Um, and it's also, as a creator, it's really fun. Like you make, you do this drawing of like epic dragon that looks sick and you're like, yeah, of course, this is going to be really rare. I'd like, I don't want many people to be able to get their hands on this if they buy a pack or whatever. Um, and I think a lot of ki like, yeah, kids who are just joining the homemade card game community and stuff, they're like, you know, get their sort of glitter pens out and make rare cards. And it's, um, yeah, it's definitely one of the main parts of this, like the, the sort of rarity and like having those chase cards is what makes a game exciting. So that's fascinating. So obviously, you know, like, I think I agree with you making rarity is such an essential part to trading card games. It's, it's unfortunately, you know, it's, it's the unnecessary evil sometimes as some might consider it, you know, um, it's really fascinating to hear uh, that from you. And it's really interesting to, to think about it through the lens that you mentioned before of the game crafter. So if somebody orders things from the game crafter, how does, how do you, the get how does the game crafter designate rarity is that something that you've chosen is that something that that is predetermined tell me all about that yeah that's something that you can you determine when you so you upload your cards onto their database and you um say right i want you know this set of 100 cards to be available in a booster pack i want each pack to have like 10 commons five uncommons three rares or whatever um yeah they they, they can just kind of do that all for you um, which is really nice, especially for, you know, people who don't want to take the, get their games like too seriously. They can just sort of, yeah, tell the game crafter what they want and they're, they're really accommodating for it, really. So, well, using Chaos Galaxy as an example, have you ever seen people who have bought stuff from Game Crafter get that super rare, get, the, get that chase card, get that awesome dragon that you drew and then like sell it in a secondary fashion? Is that something you've ever seen like, you know, for $10 or, you know, for a profit even, God forbid? Yeah, I've seen a, a couple of eBay listings, not too many, but I think four or five over the years since the game started, which, um, I, yeah, I did, see, it, it was like these, you know, the rare, powerful chase cards. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't think much of, I took it more of a compliment really at the time. Um, but yeah, that secondary market is something I, yeah, I, I don't think I really want that for the game. Again, it comes back to that passion. It comes back to you don't want that that price to really influence the way that people play, you know, the pay to play sort of thing. Like, you know, so many trading card games become in, you know, our youths and stuff. Um, it's really fascinating to hear that there's that side of things. Now, I believe that, you know, we were talking about art form before and how trading card games are an art form. And I feel like making something rare is a way that the trading card game creator or designer like yourself can sort of, you know, imbibe an excitement or a feeling to the people who are engaging with their game. You know, you open that rare dragon and you get excited. You know, it's it's a way, you know, like a filmmaker might put certain lighting in a scene or something like that, or, you know, certain uh, uh, audio track or something like that. Well, rarity is the way that a trading card game creator can create that emotional response from its audience. And it's so fascinating to see a game even like yours land in the secondary market like it's so fascinating i assume like you said you said it was a compliment but it must have been surreal to think that somebody was willing to pay for pieces of cardboard that essentially you know indirectly you scribbled on yeah it's um and that was that card as well was it was more for the reason I, i'm not a huge fan of the artwork that I, and the ability that i've given to that card it was because it was a, a seen as a good card in the competitive side of the game um yeah, it wasn't the one, one of the ones that I'd intended to be a chase card initially, which kind of annoyed. <laughs>
I mean, sometimes that's the case, right? Like we see like trading card games in, in spaces, you know, to use Yu-Gi-Oh as an example. Sometimes there's an obscure, like small character that has a really chase effect. I mean, I don't keep up with it, but I think there's a character called Max C in Yu-Gi-Oh at the moment right now that's just warping the game entirely. And I'm sure that wasn't something that was intended by the designers themselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely fabulous uh, to see that that interesting the, the interesting essentials of trading card games come in and impact something like a HTC a HTCG. Now, um my sort of next question, obviously we've talked about uh, your game, we've talked about sort of the history and I do recommend people check out that video I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, it's linked in the description, but I do want to talk about what you see as the future of HTCCGs. You know, we spoke about how Kickstarter is changing the space, changing who's coming into the space. You know, these businesses are starting to become more viable from, you know, independent ideas and stuff like that. What do you see the future of HTCGs being? Um, I, th I think taking things a lot more digital is sort of the direction. It, se it seems kind of obvious, um, but I just, because it when the community started, it was, yeah, sort of 10 people on other opposite corners of the world just drawing cards at home but i can see now a lot more with discord and reddit a lot more sort of collaboration like i wouldn't be surprised to see two or three game creators in different corners of the world sort of linking up putting their own games aside and just making a sort of collab game um, and you you're seeing collabs happen within the htcg community a lot now um, but more just like oh i've you know, this guy's designed one card for my game, I've designed one for his. Um, but I just think that sort of ease of communication between everyone, I could just see some sort of huge community game happening soon even. That's amazing. Well, I mean, I, I, just to refer back to your video, almost something like that happened years ago, back in, you know, when you first started, is that correct? Yeah, that is, yeah. So yeah, Peter Jank, the guy who really started the community, um, made a game called Dreamscape, where he got people submit artworks to him and then he made a game containing artworks from dozens of different people which was really cool but I'm, I'm thinking more in the sense of like an entire game just made like he, he was very much the overseer of that project um, but I'm thinking almost you know sort of three four people just link up together and just make a game from scratch. I'm very excited to see what comes out of collaborations like that. You know, again, it's like indie bands, you know, like I was playing with this band, now I met up with this other band and, you know, now we're playing big studios or stadiums or whatnot. It's um, it's absolutely a fascinating idea to, to think about. So one of your videos, actually, one of the more recent ones, like that, again, it'll be linked in the description, you sort of posit at the end that you are thinking about doing like an award ceremony for HTCGs. And as we know, like independent spirit awards in film and there's indie band awards and like, you know, non-charting band awards. Is this something that you're planning? Like, tell me about this idea of like having an award ceremony or some sort of award structure to the HTCCG community. Yeah. So I, I think that was more, I was just sort of thinking out loud really, but it just, it seems like a way to just make the sense of community stronger within this group of people to sort of inspire people you know giving giving someone an award for anything is like nice it's just nice to receive and it's going to like you know make you more motivated to work harder at your game or whatever well it's so interesting to think about because it's part of the evolution of this art form right like you know as i mentioned indie bands uh, get awards you know independent movies independent spirit awards get awards you know all sorts of independent art awards come up you know whether it's um comic book independent comic book awards or independent writer awards and this often dictates who we see the faces we see in the mainstream a little bit after so you know spearheading something like that i would be very fascinated to watch you uh to to do i i fully encourage you to do it yeah definitely thanks yeah i, I do need to get on that um but one thing within the community you see a lot of people they'll make a game work really hard at it for six months or something and then they seem to lose interest for whatever reason or just life gets in the way and then their games will sort of die down a lot but um i think it's yeah i think if you can stick at something for longer for about a year or so and you just really get into the flow of it making a trading card game that's when you will really start to see the reward for all the effort 
Yeah. So, I mean, I guess obviously, you know, you'd have to find a way to balance that and decide what's a complete game and what's an incomplete game. And you'd obviously have to have some sort of a criteria in that regard. Now you did mention there that the HTCG community is transient, you know, like it isn't for profit. It's, you know, people who are passionate about some things. And sometimes people are passionate about trading card games one week and, you know, a couple of months later, they're passionate about sneakers or they're passionate about painting or they're passionate about music or anything like that. You know, creative people are going to create regardless of the medium. But how do you recommend somebody who is feeling this passion at the moment get involved Involved and what is the simplest way for somebody who is super enthusiastic about the trading card game genre get involved with the HTCG community? I'd, I'd say just don't don't hesitate, like don't plan for too long. If you've got an idea for a trading card game, there's like there's no better time than the present. Just sort of put it down and do it. Like that's what I did really. I didn't didn't know where I wanted the YouTube channel or where the game where I wanted the game to go. Just sort of put pen to paper, started filming, and then you know went from there. And it's sort of become this thing that you could have never anticipated, right? Like, obviously, you know, your passion, you know, you weren't hesitated by, oh, maybe somebody won't like this. And as we've discussed, the community is very, very supportive. So um, do you want to just let me know where are some of the key spaces that people should go to post these creations? Yeah, so there's the the HTCG community Discord. That's a really good place, especially if you're, if you're you know, just starting out a game and you need some feedback on, like, rules or card templates or... Um, just yeah any aspect of your game really that's good and then yeah YouTube too if you you know if you go on a if you post a video or whatever and just comment on one of my videos or any other creators videos just like hey I've just made a game do you want to check it out people will always check them out well, that's another good point to make as well about commenting on videos and other people as well. Like we have to remember that this is also a community. So people coming into it need to understand that it isn't a reason just to come in and be like, hey, look at my stuff. It's about sharing. It's about offering feedback. It's about connecting with other people within the community. So I definitely recommend people jump onto the HTCG, uh, HTCG Discord, again, linked in the description of this episode. The, um, the Reddit as well, which will be linked as well. And, and share their creations, but don't forget to engage with the community as well. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's not, it, you know, it's such a sort of casual community. Like I said, there's there's people there in their like thirties, forties. There's people there who are like ten years old. There's just a sort of a really cool like amalgamation of people there. And awesome. well, I hope. You know, I, you know, we might be at the precipice of this whole new art form, this whole new way to come up in the trading card game space, especially if we see, you know, what we've seen over the last couple of years persevere where new games are viable, you know, may, you know, obviously there has been millions of game, games outside of the big three before and do, games do fall by the wayside, but this might be a new avenue for people to, um, to come up in the community, come up from HTCGs, if that's just what you want, if you just want to be a creative or even move into the trading card game space professionally. I am absolutely fascinated. Now, before we go, I got to ask you, you got to tell us all about uh, where people can find uh, Chaos Galaxy, how people can get involved in it. Obviously, there's going to be pictures up on the screen on YouTube version uh, for people to, uh, to take a look at and just see how much energy and, and raw enthusiasm went into this game. So tell us all about where people can find uh, Chaos Galaxy TCG. Yeah, the YouTube channel is the main place to go, really. So um, yeah, just I, I post weekly videos on there. I'm always in the comments section if you, you know, if you've got any questions or just want to link to the channel and then the gamecrafter.com is where you can buy the cards from um and then there's the discord too really they're the main places where you'll uh yeah you'll be able to join the community well hopefully you'll see a whole influx of players from this community as well just check it out and just see what a htcg a game can be and and check out the other communities as well i was so excited to hear about it and i was so absolutely amazed to see all the work you've done over these last seven years uh through your videos through other videos that i've checked out like it looks like you've got a passionate set of subscribers that just absolutely love it there's merchandise now that people can get you know they can order stuff on gamecrafter it's fantastic thank you so much not only for joining me today but being a leader in this community and really giving back to other creators who look up to you not only look up to you but look up to the genre in general as well thank you so much zach thanks man thanks for having me on that's all right no worries now i was gonna say goodbye from me goodbye from you bud bye thank you so much for joining me as well it's been an amazing time and remember check out everything about uh chaos galaxy tcg in the description as well uh I cannot wait to see where this game goes, maybe the future of Zach's own TCG creating career or even other games that get spawned from the HTCG community. All right, that's been another episode of The Rare Slot. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember, subscribe so that you can check out our other episodes of the Booster Pack and more episodes like this. Thank you so much. Remember, until next time, keep shuffling.
And there you have it, our episode with Zach from Chaos Galaxy TCG. Now, uh, find all of Chaos Galaxy TCG's links in the description. You can find, obviously, the YouTube. Those two videos of the history of homemade TCGs I mentioned as well will be linked specifically. And you'll be able to find the Instagram as well for Zach too. Now, also, you'll be able to find many links to the HTCG community. And please engage, especially if you've got an idea for a collectible game. I would love to hear about that as well. And hopefully in a few years or a little while when you've developed that idea or grown it, or even might even have one at the moment, let me know. I would love to feature some of that work on this channel when it gets far enough down the line. Now, as well, of course, remember to check out if you're looking to grow your own CCG collection or TCG collection of old games, not these new emergent homemade ones that we've been talking about, but old games, check out category one games.com they just had a revival of their website they have a whole bunch of new games on there so they'll be linked in the description also now lastly as well you can find me via the regular social medias whether that's twitter which is twitter.com slash ccg history or at ccg history or you can find me via facebook which is facebook.com slash ccg history or of course at ccg history on facebook as well if you want to let me know anything there you'll be able to find linked in the description but also uh, our email address which is the booster pack at ccg history.com and of course way down the bottom of the links in the description you're going to find our listener survey so if you want to take that survey that'll be able to let me know what sort of games you want to hear about on the channel when you started playing games so i can sort of tailor our conversations to that era and any other feedback you want to let me know so that's about it for our episode today uh, i thank you so much for joining us for this whole thing and remember you know how much i love to repeat myself as you've already heard so until next time keep shuffling